Uh, I'll get started at 6 o'clock. Uh, for anyone who's been to my town halls, and the, the couple I've had out here have been pretty decent turnouts, so you may have been uh, a few of mine. I don't give any presentation. I'm not using this TV or anything. There's nothing per se that I'm here to present to you. My town halls are structured as, as questions and answers. They're structured as uh, your opportunity to, to ask me to look into things. So I'm literally just here for you for however long it takes. It's 15 minutes and it's two hours. I'm here at your disposal. Yeah, if you've got questions about the county, you've got questions about the island, I'll do my best to answer them as, as honestly as I can with the information I have. If you just have something you want me to look into or a concern you may have, then I've got my, my notebook. I will take out a note. I'll look into it. If I get your contact information, I'll follow up with you. That's how these are structured. This is my 15th public town hall in the past 15 months. And, um, I think we've gotten a lot accomplished during this 15. We've changed a lot of stuff that for welfare. We've looked into things with some of the development and code. So I, I think they've been very productive for me. They've been very productive for some of the people who have come. So I'm just going to open it up to, to anyone who has anything to say or any questions you may have and go from there. And if there's nothing else. I'll start if nothing <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the county realizes when they moved the market, they moved all of the festival locations at Cooking Beach. According to Google Maps, it is now over a half mile long from the last trolley stop to the location of the market, which ain't gonna work. Because what it basically does is it makes it so a large majority of people will not take the trolley there. The trolley driver told me on Saturday that on a normal day during season, non-festival day, it takes the trolley between an hour and an hour and a half mm -hmm. to get just from Coquina Beach to Bridge Street. So what we're doing on festival days now that the trolley is no longer an option for many people, especially a senior who can't walk that far and then do a festival, is we're putting more cars in the way. Now, the solution to this would be that the CRA just discontinued their trolley service or their tram yeah, service. Golf cart yeah, 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 yeah. And so the vendor has a golf cart, a, a large golf cart. And so my suggested solution is on market days and festival days, contact that vendor and see if he would be interested in doing a shuttle from the last trolley stop to the new location of the market um, and include a stop at the proposed ferry stop at Cortez because that is 0.8 miles walking according to Google Maps, which again is going to mean that people cannot walk from the ferry to the market. But if we put a tr the tram service in there, okay, that it would work because we wouldn't have to move the trolley stop. And it again would make the trolley a feasible option for people to use to try to get to those festivals. The last thing we want to do is take the trolley as an option out. No, that's good. And as we were all talking about there, and then, yeah, the trolleys aren't working very much. But, uh, but where that market was moved is where Effectively moved. I don't have much say in moving that. Market. No, 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 I know. Sure. I don't but it, it's a good idea. It's got to have in the last mile effect, you know, for like a better term. Transportation between the trolley or over there, especially with people that don't want to go on. Even me that walks regularly, okay, being that I'm mobility impaired, to add an extra mile and to expect me to be able to stand up and do a festival, it just, it makes it a lot harder than it should be. Okay, and and I know people that live in my neighborhood that won't walk to downtown Home Beach because it's too far and it's less than the distance from the trolley stop to the market. Even further down. Yeah, yeah. It's a half mile. It's going to be a matter. We also have to U-turn it back around as the turn point. So maybe you could. I don't know. I, I don't have. The I don't think the trolley is. We don't have enough trolley. I I heard. Well, you're talking about adding another trolley. Now there were only four we running. Eight. The trolley driver unloaded on me while we were waiting. There were four <laughs> running when we had two festivals and a parade run. What they did last Saturday is three of them were making the trip between Coquina and Manatee Beach. They were offloading and running the other one northbound. Now the reason it took me two hours to get nowhere is I waited 45 minutes <laughs> for the trolley to go 15 blocks to get to Manatee Beach and be told I had to get off. The trolley driver was told to wait until the other trolley came before he went back north. We waited over 35 minutes. Okay, that's why I heard all of his concerns. He said, we need more beach buses. 
He said they were discontinued because mm -hmm. only homeless people were riding them put into the county. The beach buses? That's the parking rides. Only homeless people? That's what, and, and I'm quoting what he said to me, okay? I disagree with that statement, but. I guess I'm homeless. I, I think, <laughs> I think if we market them to that, that we can get more people taking them, okay? But the point is, on Saturday, okay, I'm a trolley rider. I turned around and went back home because the trolley that finally came said to me, yeah, it's going to be over an hour. And I left my house at quarter to two to try to get there by 2.30 for a band that was paying 2.30 to 4. When I was still at the public beach at quarter to four, I missed the band, okay? And being told it was going to take me another hour minimum to get there and probably two to three to come home and that my best bet was to walk back, catch the ferry to the north end and try to get a trolley back down. I'm, I'm a diehard public transit person and I ain't doing that, okay? <laughs> So, so it's an issue in season that really we need to look at. If, if we don't have the tainted trolleys, I mean, they're, they're basically buses. We can put a blue bus on. We, we can. I, I don't think the issue, for me, this is some issue, but it's not a matter of how many trolleys. They don't move them. Yeah, I think we eight more out there, they're all stopped. What difference does it make? Now it's a wall of trolleys. Now, you can't any place any faster. You're, the trolleys aren't moving because there's too many cars on the road. And whether there's one trolley or eight trolleys or ten trolleys, the trolleys aren't moving because of the traffic. Maybe maybe you guys should stop inviting so many cars. What I'm stuck in that traffic, okay, is that a lot of the locals will cut across to Cortez Beach and use that to go all the way down and bypass the traffic and then cut their way back in. Is there any way we could do something that made it legal for the trolley to go along behind the hard cars? I don't know. That would be tougher to do because we have to get approval for transit routes and things right. like that. So we'd have to reroute transit lines. I'm not sure all the people on those roads would not be thrilled that trolleys are whipping down there. People are standing out in their front yard waiting for a trolley stop over there. Always we'd be bypassing all the other trolley stops going straight ahead. I mean, is there, and and we can't really take out the medians and put a transit lane down the center because we need to have turn lanes. That's the problem. There's no, and, and that was the, the comment over here, we need another lane. There's no right of way to right. build one. And, and that's the problem with any attempt at putting more cars on this island for any reason right. because you can't do anything when you get on the island. There's no place to move the cars. We're a mile and a half at our widest point, I think. Is that right, Judy? That wide? I thought the widest point was, was down by Key Royale. And I oh, yeah, right. 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 right, but the, the, I mean, when you're, when you're basically talking about a mile width the whole way, it's oh, on that way. Understood. I mean, I think right now we're just in a position where the traffic is bad, and the, and the trolleys not, are going to be reflective of that. Because, again, we can't, just because it's rush hour per se, for lack of a better term, you, get, you can put more out there. But that's no, there are times there are times where the trolley's full when it gets to a stop and it just bypasses the stop. Understood, understood. Right. Understood. So during during when peak events occur, you like Christmas when they Christmas do that, is or other big things like that, uh, they run the same number of trolleys and you can I live at the end, I get on there and you can't get out of Anna Maria and it's full. I so, yeah, so during peak, peak times, it'd be nice maybe to That's because they're full, not because they're stopped. Correct, Correct. Right. because they're full. And you can't get out from there on, the rest of the people all the way from Manatee Park down, they can't get on the ferry. Then they, have to wait, then they have to wait another 20 minutes for the next bus that may also be full because people realize that they got on at the end where you're here. And, you know, I mean, and that would stop all the cars if, I mean, because the locals do like to take the Well, and the ferry is coming to the pier now, and it's going to be a really issue for the whole island south if the ferry fills up the trolley, yeah. okay, which is which is why, I mean, really, the trolley has been successful mm -hmm. out here for decades, mm -hmm. and it's at the point where we need to expand them, and, and four trolleys on a spring break weekend with two festivals mm -hmm. and, and a parade, it's just not enough, it's not enough, and the trolley drivers are frustrated, and they're afraid mm -hmm. to speak up because of what happens to county employees who speak up. Okay, which is why he told me, and I promised him I'd bring his concerns to the town hall meeting so that he didn't have to jeopardize his job. <laughs> whether that's true or not. Well, I mean, people don't Okay, no, all, all I'm saying is whether his perception is true or not, himself. that was his perception. Yeah, understood. I'll, I'll look at it. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, and then you. Okay. When they, and I know I shouldn't do this, but. When they do those bridges, are they going to put a, a lane for emergency in for public transportation? I hope so. That's what I've been talking at DOT about. Um, the only way to fix the traffic here, and I've said it's a previous town hall here and, and elsewhere, 
No, we're going to fix some of the traffic here to get the cars off the island. You're not going to get the people's desire to be on the island, though, right? You just need to get them out of their cars. We have the Beach Express, which stops at the Walmart and a few other stops on. But they can't it get there any faster than we can. That's the point. It's way underutilized because nobody wants to sit on a hot bus for an hour in traffic. You're going there no faster. Yeah, you don't have to find parking, but otherwise you're not going any faster. If you had an express lane and you had a dedicated parking ride on the main lane, and you could tell people, hey, we can do 15 minute turnaround here. We can pick you up here and get you over and drop you off the main beach and pick those people up back. And we're going to 15 minute rounds, 30 minutes round trip. Now you're going to have people use it, not just because it's free compared to eventual paid parking, presumably based on previous discussions, but it's also faster. So then you start getting people to use it. If people, enough people use it, you're going to fix some of this traffic. We don't have the lane to do that right now. I've talked to DOT about it. I know the state reps have all pushed for it. Other county commissioners have pushed for it. It's a no-brainer. It's the only logical solution, and DOT was open to it. So my guess is the designs are going to have that lane, but I haven't seen any final designs for it, and it's not our bridge. Uh, we're going through DOT to build it. So to some extent, since we're using their money on their bridge, they've got, in theory, final say. But they do turn to our MPO and to us to be a guide. So maybe if you, you, they would use it, and also there wouldn't be so many cars so the trolleys could get around. Well, I mean, you take the cars off in a year, it's much better. Yeah. Um, you're just not. Right now, you, there's no other option. There's no other way to get people. And we, we were working on it. I mean, the, the water ferry, and people didn't know how that was going to be. It was an unproven. It's over 360 people a day. I mean, most of the morning ones are sold out. We went from three days a week, of Friday, Saturday, Sunday, added Thursday a couple weeks ago. That started building up. So we just started today. So we added Wednesday. And that was going five days a week. So, I mean, that's it, it's 360 people a day. That's probably 150 or so cars. Is that really moving any of Probably not, but it's better than nothing at this point. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to come up with our solutions. We can't really come up with a bigger solution. And that's unfortunately years down the road. Like that, to design a bridge, fund a bridge, and build a bridge. Is there any plan to make the ferries run later when there are events in downtown Bradenton, like like on the Friday night things, or the sort of Fourth of July, so that people from the island can actually take them back after one of those events? Me? I mean, this is it's new. And so nothing's set in stone at this point. Until we figure out how many people want to use it, when they want to use it, everything's up in the air. We're, 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 we're guessing on this as much as anybody else is because we never had a ferry before. That's why we just added Wednesday and Thursday because we didn't know they would be popular days and requested days. If more people start requesting late night, uh, that's something they can feasibly do in light of lights or whatever rules on that. DC used to do that with their metros for football games and concerts. When the metro stopped at midnight, they would run them from the stadium until one or two, until they were clear out, and it was a huge success. Sure, I'm sure it's something we would look into if it looks like it's something that's Thanks, thank you for coming. Thank you very much, and thank you for representing the residents more than some of the other commissioners do. We thank you. Here's my question. I applied to be on the Library Advisory Board, mm -hmm. and you, you know what happened that's, there. That's really not a thing anymore. And, yeah. <laughs> Is it not going to go? I don't know. But I guess I'll the say right now they're not even meeting. Okay. Right, and we, we, we get some updates, but the, I think there's a supposedly it's going to be dealt with on April 23rd. We'll see. But my question is, do you know what the expectations were that that um, they weren't happy? And when I say they, you know who I mean. Um, why didn't they like the applicants? What were their expectations? What are they looking for? And I can say I'm a registered Republican. What more do they want? <laughs> <laughs> they want somebody who's not going to speak up like you. I can't answer to people. <laughs> Thoughts. I mean, I just can't. I mean, they, they do what they want to do. Uh, they, they had, yes, they wanted to play one. I just wrote a sub stack to get that people from Canada just a couple days ago and talked about this as well. Um, I don't know, because I thought the applications were great, and Tammy thought the applications were great. There was no reason not to. I even just said, hey, can we at least reappoint the people that were previously on so we can keep quorum? And you know, let's at least allow the advisory board to do The only reason we have all these empty seats is this board said we want four more seats and then they refused to seat the people on the four seats that they insisted on having in the first place. Like, 
maybe if they cared about what the kind of people were that were going to be in those seats, they should have better defined what they were. So taking the lazy way out and just saying, give me four more. And now you're picking based on searching for people's political affiliations and previous donations instead of qualifications for the job. Right, and you didn't have to state your political affiliation. Right. Obviously, it's easy to find out. You just go to right. FSOE. Give me 30 seconds. Right? Exactly. You know, but um, I just wondered if you had heard anything about what, what their expectations are and what, I, what's I, going forward. No, I heard from some of I'm not saying it's true or not, but probably. Um, but some of the people on the board were actively emailing people to ask them to apply. Like, telling people to apply so I can put you on that one. Um, I don't know what they call. I, I don't know what the defined term of like-minded individual is. Yeah. Uh, it's probably some that they, they know personally, mm -hmm. some that they know their mindset, and like I said, myself, they, they want to live in an echo chamber. They don't want anybody to have any kind of critical thinking. They don't want anyone to tell them something that they don't always agree with. They want people from an advisory board to say, "This is what you should do," and they're all going to be, "That's exactly what I thought," and they're going to do it, and then they're going to point to the advisory board saying, "We're doing what the advisory board said." Mm -hmm. That's like you put it together an advisory board that. Is this going to parrot and mimic what you want them to say in the first place? Not based on any skill sets or expertise or life experiences that, in a perfect world, are different than the board. I don't need an advisory board that is going to say what I'm going to say anyway. What's, what's the point of having that advisory board? It's a waste of time. I want people who've been different than me because I want to be able to say, okay, that's something I haven't considered. Yeah. And when it comes to like a library advisory board, people who are librarians, people who have masters in library sciences, those are people that, that skill sets I don't have and I'd like to hear from. Other people just want to say, hey, I really want to ban these 10 books. Who else wants to ban those 10 books? Oh, those people I put on the advisory board. Want to ban the same 10 books. That's that. Seemingly where it's going, I'm not saying it is going, but it's probably. Um, okay. But I can't, I can't think in. Didn't know if you had I, I, can't, I, I can't possibly dig into their thought process. So I'm sure my head. <laughs> <laughs> You're a member of Monster Learning. Oh, very dark corner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I honestly, no, I'll be, I'll be serious. Because we, I mean, we have friends who are on Mom's already, and some that I, I'm not friends with, or not, not friends with, but people I don't have any association with. Again, I don't know the, the thought process. And I'm, not, and I'm using library because you brought a library. That's sure. across all of our advisory boards. I'm not trying to pigeonhole this right. or isolate this. Stuff. We have the same thing with our MPO citizens advisory board. We refuse to seek people until different people are called. Uh, we, we had a discussion relative to an affordable housing board. We had a discussion with some of our planning group. We just had it with our infrastructure sales tax, where somebody who had been on that board for years and reapplied to the audit got booted out because of like-mindedness. And, and that like-mindedness, that person is almost identical. It's just they support something different than they want to support. That's just how these advisory boards have been trying to increase. The library just got caught up in it because it's unique in so much that the failure to seat on that particular board broke the board. Whereas failure to see because you can't meet with, without quorum. Whereas when we didn't see the MPO, it's still at quorum. So that kind of fell through the cracks. When we didn't see someone for affordable housing, it's still at quorum. It still wasn't as public or as detrimental as the library. That was a unique situation because so many seats were up because we created four new seats. So we, we created the problem and didn't come up with the system. Thank you. We're relative new relatively new to the area about five years ago was moving to and there's a lot of development around the entire county. And I'm just wondering any of you a part of the county? <laughs> I'm just wondering if the county has has impact fees on those developments to help support the infrastructure that is required in order to be able to accommodate. And so do they have one or the, do we have do we have impact fees? Uh -huh. Yeah. Everyone every well not every county has it, but almost every county has it. Okay. Uh, back in the day, in the 80s, that was concurrency, which basically, if you broke the road, you fixed the road, and it was kind of developers gaming the system to avoid having uh, to spend money for infrastructure. It switched into impact fees, which in theory is a better way of doing it. It's a little more equitable, uh, and it's collected over time, not at the last point where you actually need it. But nothing's perfect, and impact fees are far from perfect. And I always tell people it's like a positive scheme and so much that you're paying your impact fees, but what you're really doing when that developer and that home pays its impact fees that day is fixing the infrastructure for the development that was built three years ago. Because that infrastructure was paid, you know, those impact fees fixing infrastructure three years prior. You have to collect, you can't collect impact fees to you, your permit, and so you can't build the roads for those houses because you're just collecting the money that exact second. So you're always building one step behind. You run into issues like in 2000, 
9, 10, 11, 12, there was no building, so there's no impact. So they had all the houses that were built in 5, 6, 7, which is the biggest peak of development we had up until recent time, didn't have any infrastructure. That's why Moxie Low, that's why, that's why Erie, that's why you know, Lorraine were so underserved because they didn't have the impact needed to fix it. We're still catching up on that infrastructure. What's exacerbated the problem is we don't budget up impact. Because we are, we're fucking impact fees based on 2015 study, which is done based on 2013 and 14 data. And if you've been to the grocery store or any place, you've noticed a little bit of inflation. But we, our impact fees aren't tied to CPI or anything like that. We've now approved increasing the impact fees. Unfortunately, the state has mandated what theoretical maximum we can increase. But it doesn't account for if you miss the window. You're supposed to do these impact fee studies every five years. So we should have done it back in 2001. And we did, but there was some stuff with the state that had it pulled, and then it kind of got put on the shelf. Now it's been nine years, but the state said you can't increase it more than 50%. But even then, it should be 50% after five years. We waited nine years. They don't say, okay, it's 50% and then compound another 50% because of how long. They don't care how long you took since the year last study. It's still 50% from that point in time. There are ways of getting it all the way up to the full study. But to get it all the way up to the full study requires a super majority of vote of the board, and I wouldn't even get a regular majority mm -hmm. uh, to get that done. So the board originally wanted a much smaller amount. They came around for various reasons to what is now the state maximum amount. So it is an increase of about 50% over what we're charging, which is still a good $80 million more over the next four to five years. It's not insignificant. But uh, it's a far cry from what we should be collecting or whatever. So we're just waiting on it. And we don't have the money to fully catch up, nor with the even with this increase, are we going to have the money to fully catch up? We're just trying to keep doing what we can and focusing on what's most important. That's why we've been focusing, you notice, more with some more roundabouts, more lighted intersections, um, some traffic calming. Because widening roads, buying the right of ways is very cost prohibitive. We can get more bang for a buck on some of these safety issues that slow down traffic, keep traffic moving smoothly than we can widen the roads right now because we're paying about eight and a half million dollars a lane mile for a road. Whereas I can widen an intersection for less than two. But for some of the uh, developments, I mean, do you require some kind of a, a, a setback so that you can allow for, in essence, the construction of a road at some future time? Yeah, we work with this. We work on, on making sure we're taking the right of ways where we need. Uh, the, the places where we have the biggest right of issues, however, are places that were built a long time ago. I mean, you're hearing every go drive down 59, you'll see a million red signs, a hashtag, say 59. Because there's no right of way. Your, your right of way is somebody's front yard. Same thing with 75th, same thing with 63rd. Uh, we just didn't do that back then. And some places don't do it now. I mean, the, the biggest traffic bottleneck in this entire county is downtown right away. And they never took any right of way. Even in recent times, when Aria was built, and lockup self storage was built, and the, the Starbucks was built, nobody thought to take over that right of way at that point in time. You can never widen the roads. You can't knock out apartment buildings. That, that's cost for him. So we need to figure that out. Because that, that transcends, that, that, that causes a lot of the other traffic. I mean, that, that traffic there will go all the way back to 59th in one direction and all the way you know, down to 27th in another direction in some part or another. It's, it's a problem. Uh, you're starting to see that on, on Fort Hamer and Upper Manatee as well because of the bottleneck of the two-lane bridge. Uh, that's our big priority along with doing the flyover on 44th is getting the other two lanes of that bridge done to help start alleviating some of that north-south traffic, which should hopefully start alleviating some of the 75 traffic. Yeah. I've been in the county 43 years, and I've been on 59th Street a whole lot. And I haven't heard anything lately about what the plans are for that road other than when it first came out, they were going to widen it because there's so much traffic on it. In all the years I've driven it, there's never been a traffic problem other than at school time. It's driving every day. So what's happening with that? It seemed like a big waste of money. Right. Those are a couple of questions. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the easy part. Right now, the plan is the low uh, it's on the It's on the CIP to widen it. You're not seeing it being widened right now because there was a concern of working on 75th and 59th at the same time. We didn't want to block off two roads with construction in that close proximity. That way we can direct traffic from one to the other. 
So the determination was to do 75th first. It's, it's easier to get the right of way. It's going to be faster to do because it's only a portion of it that needs to be widened. So you're not seeing a whole lot being done at 59th because the decision was made to focus on 75th first. That, that didn't mean 59th went away. It just means you got put on the back burner until the other piece comes. But who said it needed widened? Because, uh, you know, there's never a traffic problem there. Years ago, I was on board. 2001, they, we had a big discussion, all of the board county measures, all of our public works, of what roads, what thoroughfares needed to be worked on. They, our, our public works, our traffic engineers, people way smarter than me about stuff like that, came up and said, okay, here's the, I forgot, it's 12 or 15 different things. Some of them were individual intersections, some was 63rd widening a piece, in the Lorraine, and some was connecting pieces like Lena Road. They put together a list of these are the top things that could help with transportation and, and traffic. And, one of them was 59. Uh, I don't recall, as almost three years ago, I don't recall the, the specific dialogue around it. There was a lot of give and take. The, the six that were picked were Upper Manatee, Lorraine, Connecting Lena, 75th, 59th, and 63rd. Those were the six that were ultimately picked by the collective board in conjunction with the traffic. Management. I don't recall the conversation. Right? But just because there's not traffic on it today, doesn't mean that's not why. I mean, there's not traffic on Lena Road right now either. The thought process is once we connect it, it'll allow for traffic on it uh, to ease up traffic on on 70 on, on I-75 and on Lake Lorraine Boulevard. Same thing with with 44. There's not a lot of traffic on there right now. We're doing a flyover because the intent is to allow traffic on it to ease up on 70 and 64. So sometimes it's not a matter of you're widening a your road because it needs widening based on current traffic. Sometimes it's you need the, the additional thoroughfare. Sometimes it's EMS, the fire districts, and so forth. Say, hey, we need better access to things. You got Blake and, and other you know, other properties down there. Again, I don't recall the specifics behind it, but that's how it got on the list. It got on the list by the county and staff presenting us with, I want to say, it was 12 or 15. And we all ranked them. We had a couple of work sessions on it, and it ended up being one of the top. So. What are they doing? Yeah. What's that? What are they doing? Well, there's a few, there's the part where it's like single down. lane, and then it, it, it widens into double lane. It's basically just making it two lanes for Madison C all the way down to Cortez, so you don't have that like merged point. I think people are somewhat confused with those two roads because where it's headed, Manatee Avenue, huh. is not being widened. So if you widen these roads between Court, you know, I know there's going to be a lot more traffic because we're building how many thousands of houses down at Cortez at oh, 75th. No, no. But if you bring more flow through there, they're all going to end up at Manatee Avenue and they're just going to turn yeah. right and sit and block the box and, you know, that's what's more confusing about our side of town. I, I get it. That, that's the problem with, with traffic, Matt. Again, I'm not a traffic engineer. Um, that's the problem with any traffic. I mean, the, the, the thought process this is always, well, if you just allow people to get here, you're going to get stuck here. But if I let people, if I widen Manatee Avenue, someone's going to say, why are you mad at widen Manatee? If you make a left, you're going to hit the beach gate. If I you think, make a right, you're going to hit the downtown unit, so don't widen that one either. Right, but what it concerns, I think, some people, since we're all driving around in it, is what you just said about a few years ago, some people prioritized some roads. And I think it's better if somebody had presented a plan so that we could understand why it all kind of makes sense and works yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, because people like to build things around here. <laughs> so somebody probably wants to build a road, they want to build a garage, you know, they want to build lots of things, but we all need to sort of understand the whole plan and how it actually is going to benefit us if we're spending money for it. Understood, That's understood. And there is a full thoroughfare plan that you can look at 20, 30, I think it was 50 years where you can see all the major thoroughfares and what the intended eventual, oh, I'm just saying 59th was on there previously. So look, we didn't just right. pull this out of a hat two or three years ago. Right. It was planned as a four lane road at one point in time, just like 44 was planning to go out to Vernon Avenue. But that was planned way, way back when. Right. Before there was a concept of the FDAB, Taylor Ranch, all right. it was already planned to do that. It's just a matter of when we do that because somebody way back then said, okay, here he's going to be this. You can look online. It's online. And it'll show you color coded. These roads are going to be four. These roads are going to be six. You can see the future decades out. Yep. Of eventually, the roads are going to be. It's just a matter of when the funding is going to be available and when they're going to get done. Right. Can we unplan? Yeah, that's what I mean. Sometimes maybe it wasn't a good idea. Is there a choice? Can we unplan? It was a mistake. We don't need to have that road widened right now. Obviously, 500 homes that are on that road don't think it needs to be widened, and those poor people live on that road every day. So can we unplan? We can undo almost anything. Okay. Um, not anything, but almost anything. So sure. Yeah, I, 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 I,
Well, I travel that road every day. I have yet to be in a traffic jam. Mm -hmm. And we're in spring break now, where everybody is home and everyone's going to their doctors, and I have never once gotten into a traffic jam. So I'm just. Like I said, and admittedly, I rarely think that. I live east of 75. I think that road from going down to GT Bray or something like that. And the development is not going to affect 59th Street, really. No. It's all east no or They're supposed to shop at the shopping center that's right near their development, too, yeah. right? Aren't they supposed to be locked in their development? <laughs> <laughs> that's how we prove all these things maybe you could explain a little bit I saw some map that showed that there was going to be some sort of elevated highway from 275 that could cut down through 59th or 26th sure. it was a drawing that's and a fairly old drawing um, that was kind of shut down by some of the municipalities it's starting to look back Okay. Here's, here's, the, here's the problem with downtown because downtown it ultimately causes all of our traffic jams because everyone hits it most people don't have to go downtown. Not a lot of downtown. Right. Uh, I was more concerned that it's restaurants and like two offices buildings in government is downtown. That we were going to build a highway sure through 26th Street or 43rd yes. Street or... Yeah, well, there, the original concept of redoing the, the bridge was to have it as a flyover to basically go from more or less like 19 and go all the way to like 301 by like Red Barn mm -hmm. and basically fly over downtown. And then you had like kind of off-ramp type stuff. That would allow everyone from north of the river who doesn't want to go downtown to not get stuck in that traffic and not cause that traffic. And what we're seeing is because 75 is so jammed up, a lot of cars when we do traffic counts are not even coming from north of the river Manatee. They're coming from Ruskin, Apollo Beach, they're coming from South Pinellas, and a lot of them are going downtown Sarasota to go to work, but they can't take 75 because it's, there's an accident. It avoids all of those cars jamming up on our bridge and hitting all of our lights trying to get to downtown which stops the east-west flow I just shoot them over entirely. So that was a proposal that was done way before I got on the board by DOT. And they were, my understanding was they were ready to go. People started complaining because they said, oh, you have a flyover, people, you know, unsavory people that live under bridges or something. I don't know. I'm like, that's not how it is now. This isn't the bridges and, like, uh -huh. the Bronx in the 60s. Like, people aren't, like, you know, keeping themselves warm with fires and metal barrels. Like, they're beautiful. Like, you see flyovers in Tampa and Orlando and all other places storefronts and shops right. and things down there. So I think it's starting to get a little bit more traction with the municipalities because the land is Bradenton on one side and Palmetto on the other side, so they have a say in this. Um, where would it land now? Because since then, the Starbucks and all that were built, and that was part of the uh, process of the landing pennants. Um, but it is something that's that's being discussed again. Because we do have to alleviate traffic downtown. And the only ways of doing it is that, or there's also talk about Third Bridge east of or west of 75 and there was 10 plans on that you know, right they were kind of all over the place. and that was the one that was seemed scarier because it seemed like it there was one that was by 26th street which right. i guess we would take all those trees down castle. those nice trees yeah, there's one closer to brain castle there's one further west like down 10th on palmetto and then cut down but those also get people out of downtown people don't have to go to downtown to get south of the river without <coughs> cutting get mm -hmm. through the middle uh, so they're all viable. Something has to be done because they can't fix downtown traffic anymore. Um, but the flyover, that, that was... But none of that is close to anything being real. It's just it's, all a dream. It's, it's on the MPO priority list. It's, you know, geared up to be designed and funded. And every DOT is on board with, with getting these bridges. All of our bridges are past date. I mean, they're, they're all obsolete effectively. It's just a matter of coming up with the funding and the, the priority list of getting it done in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. But that one's the one that can hopefully fix some of our traffic. Mm -hmm. They do that in Chicago. Right. <coughs> they, do it, they do it everywhere. Well, that's just a good place to look because, like, the clubs and stuff are on the lower levels. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's still walkable, but it keeps the through traffic. Yeah. People just and the city traffic. traffic. It's, like, it's the same thing when I mentioned, like, workforce housing. Everyone mm -hmm. thinks, like, the projects in uh, you know, the, the Lower East Side in New York back in uh, the day. What these things are. But people think the same thing with life. They just think, think the worst. And then you build it, and all of a sudden the traffic gets better. And then I guess it's really nice. There's a park under this flyover. Now, I used to live across the street in, in Silver Spring, Maryland, from this building that literally was 50% luxury housing. I think it's now gone to 60 40 luxury housing. The other half was subsidized housing. All the pilots lived there. It was a very good idea in New York and things like that. Uh, when will the ports paint? 
uh, be finished that they're doing on the island. I think at the end of our street, it's been opened up somewhere around 11, 11 times, and uh, it's probably not done yet. Uh, they'll probably have to open it up another three or four times. Uh, it seems like it's the uh, cat chasing its tail or the dog chasing its tail. Uh, they go through. Now they're, they're doing a, a grouting because apparently they got leaks and they're trying to stop the leaks by grouting around the pipes. Uh, the whole, it looks to me like this whole job has been a fiasco and the, the company that's doing it, it I hope that somebody in the county really looks at, at what they have done because I'll tell you what, they, if I was running this city, they, they would, there would be problems because it's, it's terrible. What's what we're doing? We have to them. call them directly, mm -hmm. and and we have to call them a fire hydrant late in Lady Jar for three months, and we said something about it. They picked it up, and moved it up the street. Two days later, they're down there digging a hole, putting a fire hydrant in. Now, whether they connected it, I don't know because they had a dig there again the other day. So, I mean, it's it's just ridiculous. This company I mean who, who is supervising spectrum yeah that's a good point <laughs> is anybody in the county yeah, I, mean, I, I, I put it on my notes to look I mean I, I don't I don't know who the supervisor is on every project it's we have going on in Lansing County but I, I can definitely look at it it's like we want to talk about traffic the, the traffic that usually goes down homes it's it's all screwed up across the street on what 50 55th, 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 uh, 50th, or whatever it is, 51st. I mean, 52nd, they got a big hole. It's, it's go out that way. You'll, you'll bounce all over, you know. And I have one other question. Okay. You uh, advertised in your uh, flyer that came out that you were hoping you could find a place to park. Did you have any trouble? <laughs> <laughs> that brings me to my next question. <laughs> a few years ago, I contacted St. Pete Beach about their um, sensor program, uh -huh. parking sensors, and they were wonderful about sending me information. I shared it with the county, I shared it with the city, and um, at the time, Sherry was with the county, and she said, oh, I'm glad you brought it up because we've done a little bit of legwork on that, and we do want to pursue that. So we know that there are parking spaces available. But people just don't know where they are. Now, I know the city will say, well, there's a map, but that's not the real time. You know, people need to know in real time where those places are. So what is the feasibility of getting a sensor program? Well, very few of the parking spaces are mine. Uh, most of them are city. A good proportion of them are city. We've got the one lot right there. You can just eyeball that one to see what parking is available. That's it. I'm a huge fan of that. I've actually talked to the whole future about it. We should have it in all because we talk about traffic. Part the, the biggest part of traffic is people circle around and look at the parking. Half the time they drive past one of the side roads in the three spots, and they just keep driving looking for parking on it. If you had sensors and you could just look on a map and say, "Okay, make a left and two turns," and then there's three parking spots down there. But that would be a lot cheaper than a parking garage. <laughs> <laughs> At thirty-five million dollars, probably plus. Yeah, I, I don't disagree, but I don't think we need parking either. I don't think that right, but what's the feasibility of getting a sensor program? Sure, it's something. Look, again, they're not my parking. My feasibility of getting on the beach to do something and some beach discretion based on the beach parking spots. So. You want me to answer that? Sure. No. We did go out to RFP, and we do have vendors that are willing to do that, and it would be going to paid parking, and we're just not ready to go to paid parking. Um, if, when the commission decides they want to go to paid parking, we have this um, the companies that are willing to do it, and it would be sensors that would be planted. As you can see, we've improved all the parking. It's ready to go to pay. But what only could, could, because it's going to cost a lot of money to put that system in, hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay. and That's we're not going to put the do. bill. It, but if you well, want to do pay that, parking, it would, like, it would the, pay the for tourist it. development. Group help or yeah. something and can the county can the county or can we get grants? Right now, the county's not willing to really do anything for us um, or as TDC. Um, everything we've asked for, even multi-use paths, they don't want to do anything for the city of Palm mm -hmm. Beach, and it's for their tourists. So, it's we're working as best as we can. But what we've done with our mapping system and improving the parking. And we fly a drone at Public Beach every single day to show parking at a glance, to show people what trends are. 
if I come, what, it, what was it like yesterday if I decide to go to the public beach? Is there going to be parking? We put, you know, peak time, what it looks at public Why beach this time of year. Why do not want to go with paid parking? I mean, that's all around us now. Because I'd rather not make enemies with county residents by starting to charge for parking. Um, we don't, I, we're not, I, I don't feel personally that we're there yet. We will probably be in another five to ten so, years. But the I think people would be willing to pay for the parking if they knew they had a place. Marjorie, have you seen the backlash to the um, paid lot in Raymond Beach? Yeah, there's a lot of backlash. Well, Joe's used to be. Okay, because he's now charging fifteen dollars. Oh right, I mean, but, but that's why I say. Right. 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 I think there's a difference, and I'm gonna. Well, I agree with you. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm, 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 I'm not opposed to pay parking. Very right. I don't see why you don't. Go to pay I mean, for the Brady Beaches, they're getting backlash. Park because they don't have parking for their stores because they don't build proper parking down there. Which I don't care. I think parking. I agree with you. I agree with you. Oh, I want to here. You're not gonna get the same backlash because. All the commercials are required to put parking in. Like, there, the backlash is mostly going to come from the storefronts down in Bradenton Beach. Say, hey, how is someone supposed to come get pizza for me? They have no, they, you know, they don't want to pay for parking just to walk in and grab a, a slice of pizza. Here, the, the commercial spots don't have to go pay. You're only talking about the city spots that have to go pay. We're only talking about beach access spots, correct? Well, you you want to be in conjunction with all the parking. You want to be in conjunction with Anna Maria, so you're not pushing. All of your paid people to get free parking in Anna Maria. They didn't really Same have thing with Brandon anyway. Beach. Right. It so has to be a concerted effort, yeah. and everybody needs to charge equal. Um, from but I, I don't have any dialogue with our district representative. All I'm hearing is what people are saying. He's saying at different, con, you know, different places where he's speaking. But if, if but if he's actually looking at this parking garage as being a cash cow where the county will make millions. I don't want to make profit off of people coming to our beaches. You know, I wanted to pay for the pay for the system, not make it as a money making thing. Because I think the beach should be uh, economically feasible for everyone. It's everybody's beach, and I feel it's it's a great place to be. And I don't think it should be a profit thing for the city of Palm Beach, nor do I think it should be for the county. Well, but everybody profit. has to be yeah. on board with. Everybody has to pay, charge the same amount, and everybody has to be ready to do it at the same time. And as long as we don't have a partner in the county to have those discussions, it's, it tells me it's All not time yet. Right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the problem is if right to me starts charging for parking, that's going to destroy your parking even more because people who want it to be economically feasible right. on the beach are going to come and park down come. Holmes Beach that's and then that's they can charge for parking. It's going to cause even more problems. Cocaine is not charging yet. Yeah. But once cocaine is decided, that parking, parking is yes. more for the we restaurants. We have to do it all the same time. Yeah. Enough laugh from Anna Maria as it is. That's who who's going to be up in arms. I, I, I would just offer that 15 bucks an hour changes the jury feel and nature of the idol, and you may be making a little. Somebody may be making money on that. But when you when you are seeing all these advertisements about the hometown feel, the the you know that sort of retro feel to the island, that changes it dramatically, and it, it's almost like paying parking in the big city downtown. I mean, uh, at fifteen bucks an hour. Okay. That's just a, uh, yeah, fifteen bucks an hour is extreme. But at the end of the day, a couple of things. One, the supply chain. It's, it's part of the it's part of the way you fix your parking is to make sure that the parking demand goes the parking supply. Market worse. Um, but I agree. Until, like we talked about the bridge in the third lane. Really, before you really want to start charging for parking, you want to give someone an alternative to driving. Because then you're basically just, you might as well put a price tag on the beach for people to come because you're basically saying you have no way of getting here except for your car and it costs you $15 an hour to park your car. Yes, it's going to help with things like carpooling. Instead of having four kids getting four cars and drive here because one of them may want to leave 15 minutes early, they'll get one car. And, you know, that'll help with some parking because they will split the cost of it. You know, it's just like like the rate, like the MJRAs at one point did something where if you showed up with a car of four people, the parking was free. Because they encouraged carpooling, but they also saved three parking spaces by doing that. So it made sense for them to do it. So there are creative ways of handling the parking, even if you're going to charge parking. You can have discounts for residents, just like they do with like a lift pass for seating. Right? No, we can't. If you're a Manatee County resident, you can have a discount. George, we can't because the beach refurbishment funds 
require that everyone be treated equally. Correct. Only for the parking, the minimum parking spaces near the beach. That doesn't right. count things like the church parking and the other parking that's outside of the, the radius of it. There are ways of Right, right, right. But we can't. I understand. You we can have say, to treat everyone equally when it comes to the parking spaces. Parking. Only with those parking spaces. You can say that the 200 parking spaces of a church is the mm-hmm. prison only part of the you uh, But we got to fix something. I, I'm not adverse to it. But it ultimately helps in supply and demand. But it does need to be island wide, otherwise, you're just going to have people gaming the system. We can kind of waded into this, but I'm just curious. In the paper about a year and a half ago, there was quite a bit of uh, press about how the county wanted to take over the island and basically. In my, in my me paraphrasing, get rid of the three towns and make it more. They're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's literally like. Talk to me after the meeting. I'll catch up. Go ahead. So I, I'm just wondering: Is the county, in fact, still pursuing taking over the county? I mean, over the island? The state. Uh, it's not the county that's doing. Yes. Oh, yes. The mayor's a lawyer. That's not fair to say. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. This is not here. Will Robinson and, and boy, see, George can't say this. Talk to me after the meeting. I'll catch up. Okay. Yeah. So we know. 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 We most recently, they looked at whether or not the town of Longo Key should be all of Sarasota County, all of Manatee County, or, or stay 50 50. In that case, the study came back and said, yep, it should probably be all in Sarasota County. Yep, they're not. They're still 50 50. It's not a binding study, it's a recommendation, it's just data. The state delegation authorized the study to look at what sounds like now four different scenarios. Uh, it keeps, it's, it's a moving target. Uh, apparently. But right now it seems like four different scenarios. One is keep three separate cities and just kind of look at some efficiencies. Like maybe share some police or work together on your waste. Whatever. Let's look at some efficiencies and see if we can keep the company. The second was consolidate all the cities. Leave it as a city, but it's one big Amory Island city. The third option was to disband all three cities and merge it in the city of Raiden and effectively making this part of the city of Raiden. Uh-huh. And the fourth is to disband all the cities and hand it over to the county as unincorporated Manatee County. That's done via the, well, it's not really a money thing. That's not the issue here. I know, and you're not the first But that was the that. excuse. Here's the thing, here's the thing, though. We don't get many, we don't really get meaningfully more taxes if it's unincorporated. Because we already charge you county tax. You, you pay county tax whether you're in the city or not. The only difference is we have some nominal little 0.7 mil for unincorporated, which is nothing. You're paying over 2 mil right now to stay as a city. But the city of Bradenton is So we don't, we don't really make, what's that? The city of Bradenton is 5.8. That's where I'm going with it. So if, you were, if, if it merged in the city of Bradenton, they make money, not the county. Because city of Bradenton will charge you almost 6 mil compared to your current two. That's where your taxes go jacked up, if that option comes down. It's the only option yeah, that is meaningfully cost prohibitive to you. The county wouldn't get meaningful financial benefit from it. Where you risk with the county is, you've got people like I live east of, four of us live east of 75, out of the seven of us. You would turn over all of your responsibilities to the county, which is which includes development services. So all approvals of height restrictions, density, what can be built here, whether or not a Chick-fil-A or McDonald's could, could come in here, whether or not a public comment <coughs> would be at the discretion of the planning commission and the board of county commissioners that they got turned over. And you know what we have to make clear water. That, that's my point. So that's so not a money thing. It's a control thing. If it goes to the county. If it goes to the city of Brady, then you still lose control. The city of Brady then would be similar in terms of their, their views of development, but it would also cost you a lot more money for the right to have them build over. Who makes that decision? Uh, We've only done one study. The, the, the study is being done at the state, not us. Like the board of county commissioners got signed something and asked for a study. We're not paying for a study. We didn't authorize the study. It was done by the state. Who makes the decision of what happens with that study? Yes. I don't know. We've only done one, and it was in my life or my time here on this board, and that was the Longo Key one, and that just went away. Nobody ever made a decision because the default was going to any time, and so there was no formal decision. It was just. You know, we didn't want to give up half of Longbow Key, obviously. And so it just got a, what about yes? Um, Longbow Key actually asked for that study. They wanted to see if there was a benefit 
for going to the county or Sarasota. So since they they weren't as threatened as we are with this because we didn't ask for the study, we didn't ask to be taken, we didn't ask to be merged, and it's a complete different thing. So since the count, since Longbow Key asked for the study, they would have been the ones that would have made the decision with a referendum yeah. by the people, they did have a referendum. and we didn't get that opportunity. Oh, and so they so have so to long, the, 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 long and short of that is, we don't know. This is a, this isn't a, something I've done already. So we're spending five hundred thousand dollars for a study, and we they have absolutely wants. no idea who's going to control our fate. Does that we get no say. Does that seem logical? Eventually, have to be a referendum on whatever whatever yeah. happens. Yeah. I don't know. Because yeah. I, I, I honestly like, don't know. I tell you guys all everything I know, even if it's not public. Because the I, I don't know what it was fifteen years ago. If it, was, if it was city initiated, initiated, yes, we would have been obligated to do a referendum to see what the people think. That's what the beauty is of our charters. Right. Our charters would be gone. The state would take over. And so I'm not certain if they would care what we want, you know, to hear from the residents. Yeah, because like, 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 roadmap from Opaga and they said you're not going to find one in the Fuller League of Cities in Florida. You might have to reach nationally to see what that roadmap would be because it just hasn't been done. So we don't know what the outcome well, who's, spend, who's paying for it? The state legislature, because I wrote them, and that brings up the question. They're saying they're not going to make this information public. Isn't it public funds that are paying for that? They don't have to. Again, it's the state, it's not me. I've heard the same. I haven't seen anything about it. I work here. And I haven't seen anything about it. And I've approached them. I said, is there an update? Do you have any kind of draft? Has there been any information so far, even past? Is that legal? I'm not, so mm -hmm. the study will be done. Uh, I, I, I think record laws are more of a recommendation nowadays. Okay. Mike, so you're going to be done. A decision is going to be made, but we don't know who the decision is going to be made by. More likely it's going to be the state, since the state has initiated this. So our fate is in the hands of the state. Mm -hmm. It's pretty no, much no. What, what you're saying. It's not what no. well, I'm I say I have no idea how it's going to be done. And, and Mayor Fisher has no idea. Right. And the state of Florida has no idea because it's never been done before. I'm not saying the state is going to take control and make a decision behind closed doors. I don't know how it's going to be done. But it does because it's never been done before. I can't say this is how they did it the last four times. I do feel the county board would have a say in the matter. That's why it's important to have people on the board that represent yes. Yes. the cities. Yes. I would certainly think that the county has some influence over the state's decision. We would hope. Well, yes, we would hope. So, but I don't even have a supervisor of election. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Okay. That shows you how we got to worry about that one first. <laughs> yeah, that's another one. <laughs> that's another word. <laughs> Several years ago, uh, there was a, a committee in, in Holmes Beach to look at Pier cities similar to Holmes Beach and Maria Brington Beach. And one of the cities we investigated was Kenneth City. And in speaking with their town manager several years ago, before they uh, instituted a town manager program uh, style of uh, government, the state almost took them over because they were such a mess. Yeah. Financially, administratively, managerially. So the state, in this instance, it sounds as though they have the power because that's what we were told by yes. them. Yes, and, and what you're saying is a little different, though. They do have the authority to do it. If, I mean, there's cities that have gone bankrupt. There are cities yeah. that have just been like a, a disaster. There, there are scenarios like that. This isn't that, though. But this is they don't have that. Yeah. They're not showing up in front of a court saying, look, judge, this is an insolvent city. We have to take them over for the, 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 the viability of it. That's not what this is. This That's is a little great. different. Like they've done that with fire districts too, where they say, look, you can't even afford to put out a fire. You don't even have a working fire truck. We're taking you over and handing you to this other fire district for the safety of the citizens. They have done that on isolated cases for cause. This isn't for cause. This is for development. population. I yes. heard, I've read, heard that um, they say we don't have enough population. We don't have enough registered voters in the three cities. This whole county is over 10,000 people. Yeah, I don't know. That's how it's coming. I mean, look, if, if, you, if you find some place in the yeah. state constitution that states a city has to have a minimal number of people, then I'll stand corrected. But I don't believe there's any place that says that a group of 100 people can make their own city if they so go make their own city. I, I've never seen it years. They don't get turns because it's only like 
50 people living in these townships, and they all like rotate who's going to be in charge of them. So I don't care how many cities there are. You're going to have twice as many cities. That said, you know, I think, and I, and I talked to all the mayors at one point in this first company, you should kind of be okay with a study in theory. And I think Mayor Murphy may have said that. You're going to get a free study. This is costing a lot of money. You get to see where all the efficiencies are. Maybe there are ways that the city can work together to save everyone a few bucks or provide better service. As it relates to unwinding the cities, I think that's ridiculous. That's, that's an overreach by the, city, by the state because these are chartered cities, and nobody who's lived here, whether they live here permanently or they invest here as an investor, they got Airbnb or a shop, was forced to be here. And I would guarantee you, with a very, very few exceptions, those really, really old people, these were all cities when they got here. And they voluntarily chose to come out to be in one of these cities. So to say they just didn't know any better, and the state knows way more than the people who voluntarily moved there, is, is ridiculous. I just think it's really over. So I don't mind a study, because I like to see efficiencies. I, I hope I piss them off enough to get a study from Mount County and figure out some free efficiencies. But I don't understand the concept. And I've been saying that from day one, the minute this thing came out. I thought any level of consolidation is ridiculous. Blending it in with, with City of Bradenton is a completely disingenuous plan. It's almost offensive as one of the options because the original concept of the study, the argument for the study was to save money. It was literally stated that people who live here are getting taxed too much because of the inefficiencies of the city. So one of your options is to triple the taxes. Who, who said that? Will Robinson. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, that's not even that. And there's no way you guys should ever want to be in you know, corporate. Uh, because it's too big. You're, you're too unique. You know, you see what happens with people like Cortez or Elwood Parks fighting tooth and nail to keep Elwood Park the way it is. You see my ACA stressing over the, the development going that way. There's only so many unique pockets around here. You know, so like you guys, Terrace, you see how I need to be like, keeping your power as much as you know as possible. And, and this is effectively being pushed to take that away from you. When you're going to vote, put it on a ballot. See what people who here vote, whether or not they want to be consolidated. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the answer to any 95 to 5 in terms of that vote. We have a 5 ring paid off the vote that way. <laughs> so, so, you know, what you guys decide. I, I appreciate everything you just said. And, and I agree with it. And I expect that most people sitting here probably agree with it. And so my question to you, which is going to be a difficult one for you to handle, and I understand why it would be, can you speak, uh, you go to meetings in the board that you're part of, the commission, and I, I'm sure you would be, for a million reasons, reluctant or unable to speak for all of the other commissioners. But as best as you can, can you tell me what the county commission's position is, or co positions, if there's more than one, on this issue? We've heard what your position is. It's but never been you're, discussed. You're, it's never been, that's hard for me to believe. It, it's true. It's never been discussed. We've never had it as a board agenda. Mm -hmm. We never wrote, sometimes we do things where we're writing a letter in support of LECA that's being approved tomorrow or meeting to help support funding. But, so we do on occasion as a board get together and discuss, hey, maybe we should write a letter in support of some bill being passed or something going on. This has never come up where we've all said, hey, let's sign a letter to the governor supporting this study or this version of it or this, this scenario. We've never had that discussion. Due to sunshine, to the extent you believe it exists, we've, you know, I've never had this discussion on or off without of us with anybody. And you don't if, I do, if I do make an educated guess, I'm guessing everyone else on the board is in favor of some change, otherwise it probably wouldn't be happening. Uh, what that change is, I don't know. If I had to guess, and some sort of priority, I would say leaving it the way it is is probably number four for most of them. Consolidating into one is probably number three. And the going into the city of Bradenton or going into unincorporated is somewhere tied for a problem. I just have an obvious question. What's the political advantage to them taking this position? Because it seems like it's both pretty outrageous. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell you exactly what, what their political advantage is, because they don't care about the votes out here, because there are arguments that not enough people out here voting, and it's only really voting for two, well, I guess, three seats. Mine, the other at large, and the district three. The advantage of taking control of this, in some people's mind, is you, you take over control of all the development rights out here. And development rights are very valuable. And they get people want development rights, or looking to help people stay in the elected positions. But what happens when you kill the goose who's playing the golden egg? That's a very good point. <laughs> because they're being very short-sighted, in my view, and I don't want to say only a short timer, uh, but nobody is coming to Bradenton on a regular basis because of 
Great. The parade lieutenant itself, they're coming because of the beaches. They move and on to the next goose. Yeah. That's what they and do. So, they ruin yeah. this goose and then they go to the next goose. So, yeah. yeah. But so the people who are living here ought to make sure that they, they, they don't have control of the folks who are going to do that and move on. Um, you got people who are vested here. I, 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 you know, I'm, no, I, I hear what you're saying. It's more of a statement than a question, and I because I, I agree. With you. I mean, that's why I said. And I talked to people that I was just out at Edward Park last week. I was there for six hours. I was out at Cortez for the festival a couple weeks ago, hanging out with everyone out there. I was up at Terracia speaking to their VA a few weeks ago. These are unique pockets. Like we've got a lot of single-family homes. We're working on a lot of big condos in downtown Bradenton, and the land was just sold in downtown Palmetto for a new condo. We don't need that everywhere. And I'm not saying. It's not important to have those too. I live in one of those houses that people love picky back or whatever you want to call them. I live in those. It is what it is. But there are people who don't want to live like that. And once you get rid of Cortez, once you get rid of this island, once you get rid of Terracilla, once you get rid of Seattle, once you get rid of Elwood Park, once you get rid of Niagara City and Memphis, and all these, you're never ever going to get it back. You can't rebuild history. And so the longer we can hold on to, the better. There's plenty of land to build things. I mean, unfortunately, we keep using horizontal footprints instead of vertical footprints, which takes up that much more space. But you got to protect it, because you're right. At some point, you're going to kill the golden goose, and what you're going to end up with is one of two things. You're either going to end up with a lot of regret from people who live here, or the people who live here will forget what it used to look like ever happened. You're just going to end up with more people with more money who can afford to live in nicer places out on the beach that didn't come here because they wanted to go to Tuffy's and Skinny's and places like that. They came here because, like, this eight more beach bistros and they're all going out to some formal dinner and they're just here with their retirees and it's a beach that their grandparents can or their grandkids can play when they come and visit. That's and they'll forget what this place ever looked like. Because it'll be twenty years, thirty years down the road. You gotta protect it now. And I do that with all of the areas around here. The more we can we can protect those areas, the, the better off managing counts the whole gonna be because you have to have some open diversity. What I know you probably heard this a million times, but I don't understand, and I'm not against development, but what they did, they're doing in Cortez, it started out to be 3,500, and even uh, Aqua is going to be 6,000. 6, I mean, yeah, well, don't they ever think of traffic? Why can't they just let a development have like 13,000 square, square foot yards or something so you don't have that many people? Well, I mean, that's, they are, that's way back, look, well, okay, because well, Lake Forest was, was approved. We, we, we. That, that, was, that was a proof back in like 2008 or something like that. Over 6,000? I don't remember what it was. It was I literally it was like, it was, it was like 15 years ago when that thing yeah. started being discussed. So I don't know, because things come back over and over again. I mean, modifications and changes and type of changes. Way back in 1989, we wrote the comp plan, and we're reworking on it right now and updating it. They created a future land use map that basically looked ahead and said, down the road, you can rezone different parcels of land to something else because this is the trajectory of growth for anticipated. First off, they way underestimated because the growth was way faster than they assumed in 1989. Mm -hmm. um, but some of those things, like Lake Flores, had reasonable zoning where you could actually build things. And it's not one, eight, one house per acre. There's no density. There's no density. No, there's density. But where our comp plan gets created is one, because the Board of County Commissioners can approve whatever they want. It's, it's, it's the, comp, the, the, the future land use map is a suggestion more than a guarantee. Um, but we have a lot of incentives to do other things. If you're on a, a corridor, you can get density incentives. If you're on a commercial note, you can get a mixed use density and get free commercial space that you can build. And in exchange for building commercial space, you can basically double your density in other places. All that's built into the code. As long as you're building, to our comp plan, according to our land development code, we have limited flexibility, not zero flexibility, like some people would say, but limited flexibility to do a whole lot with it. And when we talk about the thoroughfare plan I pointed to or mentioned, with all the colored roads that go from two lanes to four lanes to six lanes, they factor that in. They look like like Elcon is you know is scheduled to be a full four lane road all the way through. And that's where it turns into 63rd, and we're already widening that to four lanes. And then 51st is supposed to cut down through IMG all the way down to Elgin Keys to work. So there's all the thoroughfares already in the plans that were in the plans to account for future potential growth whenever the owners of Lake Forest decided to build. So I don't know the, the, the specific scenario as to how that density came out. It was a long time ago. But, um, I mean, it doesn't even think that Cortez is good luck now and you're putting 8,000 more places. 
Yeah. You know. Um, but, but part of it, no, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, part of it is, look, I, I, I know we're going on endless rants about the state. A lot of the problems you see have to do with how the state requires them. I mean, they're the ones who put the growth management plans in place. They're the ones that are so strict that they changed the rules even recently that basically make it almost impossible for someone like you to sue us or developers to stop a development because if you lose, and you're going to, you have to pay their, their legal fees. That didn't exist a couple of years ago. Now it does for the sole purpose of discouraging you from trying to fight bad development. Because those people, those developers have way, way more money and a team of attorneys and they're going to beat you down. They're going to drag that on until you run out of money. And I've seen it. You saw it with the Cox dealership on 64. You saw it, you know, you see it down in Terra. You know, with the commercial piece of front. They're just going to wear you down. And that's the state. The state's doing that. There's a lot of restrictions. The Burt Harris Act, which basically says if somebody looks at a future land use map and says, hey, I'm supposed to be able to build six units per acre here, and this Board of County Commissioners didn't let me build six residential units, and this map said I can build it, and I bought this land assuming I could, they can sue us in court. They most likely win in court, just like in Tarrant. So they've really tied people's hands because where it used to be individual county commissioners, individual public, individual municipalities, could look at each parcel of land and do what's in the best interest of the citizens on that parcel of land. We really no longer have all those rights. Not zero. We we you know we, we decline things when they don't make sense. They're they don't conform properly or somebody asks for special exceptions above and beyond the plan, like they want less buffers or they want even more. We can decline it. But we certainly have our hands tied a lot because of the state. Does it make a difference if you're a chartered county versus a non-chartered county with respect to all these state requirements? Some it does and some it doesn't. Um, when it comes to the, a lot of the gross stuff, it really doesn't. Um, because a lot of that, they specifically state that it supersedes charters in terms of some of that rules. Like stuff like, you can't, like recouping legal fees, that has nothing to do. You can't put something in your charter saying that developers can't recoup legal fees from the other side. Like you can't supersede the state on something. Uh, most of the time, that the charter is going to have more effect with how you're governed as opposed to the right. rules. So, explain to me how do we balance utility with all this development? How do we provide for their utilities for all this development? Like specifically, like water sewer type? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, like sure. water sewer. Sure. Um, we've got a similar, we talked about impact fees earlier. Um, we have something similar it's called a facility investment. It gets charged to every house, every commercial thing, just like an impact fee, but it's separate. It's to pay for the, the pipes to get to, uh, the, to the, uh, the building or the house. It's to pay for the connections. So we charge a separate fee, and that's supposed to go into a pot of money that helps with maintaining our, not only maintaining our utilities, but expanding the capacity of utilities for future growth. I've stated on a number of occasions, both on the dais and various town halls, that we're running into a problem there because we don't collect enough money to keep the capacity on pace of the growth. Because in part, capacity isn't for water, isn't the kind of thing where you can just incrementally do it. You're doing it in big chunks that are super expensive to do. You're building a whole reverse osmosis plant. You're building a whole water treatment. Correct. They're very expensive to do. So you have to get a critical mass of fees and, and funding in order to build that, to jump it. You, you're not, it, it's not a straight line, it's set in terms of increased capacity. Right now, we're scheduled to hit our capacity around 2037. That's what that, that eventually was the case. We don't have unlimited capacity, it's just impossible. Like, we can't even get the rights from the government to treat unlimited capacity. Uh, eventually, our group was going to catch up with one dam. I mean, we're one of the few counties in the entire state that are self sufficient with water now. Uh, back in the day, there was the Tampa Water Wars, maybe, maybe, where they were basically weaponizing water and overcharging other counties and, and holding them hostage. At that time, the state required everyone to be part of a water authority. Or at least if you wanted state funding, like through Swift Model. So we're part of the Peace River Water Authority. It's us, Sarasota County, DeSoto County, Charlotte County. Together, we've got a massive plant with big reservoirs out on Peace River over south of Arcadia and Southern County. Whenever we are at a point where we need to start buying water from someplace that we can't provide ourselves through the day and through certain water, we can start buying water. So we're never going to run out, I always tell people, you're never going to run out of water coming out of your town, but the question is going to be how much did that water cost? Because right now our water is cheaper than anybody because of the day. Like way cheaper than almost anybody else. Right? 
once we have to start getting into Peach River, we have to build the capacity to store the water in Peach River. We have to build the pipes to get it here from Peach River. The infrastructure to start utilizing Peach River is going to be very expensive. And we have to build that. And, and we're not under we're not under developed right now with our utility plan. We are supplying everything out east, and we're going to be able to do the right. six thousand of course. Right now, not only do we supply everything in Madison County, we sell five million gallons a day to Sarasota because we've got the extra capacity right now. So Sarasota needs some capacity, mainly North County, because they the way their pipes work, it was under pressure in North County, so about five million gallons a day will be their north, like just south of the university area. So we've got the capacity. Now. And we have the time to build out the infrastructure before we hit capacity. Um, this is a discussion I have had about the east of the FDF developments that just got approved. And then I had this discussion on the dais. And I said, hey, our 2037 plan is based upon anticipated growth. And that anticipated growth is based upon parcels west of the FDF line, the future development area boundary, because that's the only place you're supposed to be able to build. Now we just approved 12,000 houses east of the FDF. Where did that factor into our map? Like for 2037, and it didn't. So now, if you look at our newest land development, uh, like our land use summaries, they actually have a new table that shows how much water capacity. Like they added that now, that shows this is how much water capacity it is based on normal zoning, this is what it is based on the request. So we can start assessing that, and we're monitoring a lot closer than we were. Uh, that said, that 2037 is going to ratchet down. It's, it's going to go to 36 or 35 in some way, just because of the future growth out east that wasn't accounted for in 2037. So sooner rather than later, this board's going to have to decide, hey, are we going to come up with new ways of creating capacity locally, or are we just going to bite the bullet and start using water for Peach River, which is what Sarasota does for almost all their water, what Charlotte does for almost all their water, what Soda does for 100% of their water. And if we're going to do that, we need to start figuring out, because it's going to be very expensive to build the reservoir, build the pipes and infrastructure. I mean, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of infrastructure to get it up here. Uh, so we're going to have to bond for that and start building that out. Um, which is fine. I mean, utilities is a very expensive investment. But uh, we're going to have to figure that out sooner or later because it's going to take years to get that permit and get that built, get the water to us. And we can't. Water's not the kind of thing where you can miss by a year. Like, you can't have that one year, like, sorry, everyone, we're not going to have water. Don't hire spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have climate change figured under this whole water plan because the reports that are coming out now are saying that water crises are going to start happening a lot earlier because we're having record climate change. Okay, we're, we're losing icebergs, yeah. we're having rivers dry up. Um, so have we accounted for any of this? Those two things sound <laughs> like they, they cancel each other out. Like, you know, if we're losing icebergs, we're maybe melting. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not climate crisis. Are you worried about overflowing rivers? Is okay, okay, like, this is not my area, I just read. Okay, I just read what the news says, and they are worried about this, especially in tropical areas. I, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't looked in to see how we factored in climate change or water. I'm just focused on getting water out of the place. Because that's something we need to think about. It's the same year that Social Security blows up. It's probably good five years to build out the infrastructure. So you want to start. I mean, we, we, we do keep very close. First of all, our utility department is insanely good utility. Uh, and they're very smart. I have monthly briefings with them to go over the water capacity to everything else we're doing. They're very good. We hired Evan from up in New York. He's like one of the best utility directors in the country. We hired him. So I do have confidence that they're on It's just, and we look at some things. I went out to Altamont Springs. Altamont Springs does all kinds of crazy stuff. I've ever been there. It's like, it's in Seminole County, the right? They've got autonomous bands driving around, and they got the floating solar panel. They got it's like a Tesla. But they created, well, they created, but they're using really cool kind of packet water treatment where they, they take like the non global water and shoot UV rays at it and make it drinkable water. And, but it's a small packet. It's like maybe, well, it's a little bigger than this room, but not much bigger than this room. Certainly smaller than the primary. There's a large district community. Yeah, and, you can, you can, and, and they're not that expensive to build. And you can build these things and run your non potable water through them and create capacity. And that could delay this tremendously. And you can put them in different places in the county. I believe, because I put Evan and, and the utilities in touch with Altamont Springs. I know they've been having conversations. I believe they were going over there to tour these, because I toured one of them a couple months ago. Uh, I think they were supposed to go tour it. So we are looking at, we're looking at options to try to keep this in 
you know, in Manatee County, as long as humanly possible. It's the cheapest way of doing it, number one. Two, I trust our water, insider borders, more than I trust someone else's water. Two, not because I don't trust the county, but it's just every extra foot I have to send water is one more place where a mistake can happen or a problem can happen or a pipe could burst or something else. The more I can keep it here, the more options I have, the better. So we are looking at some alternatives to expand it. I have a question about a problem that sort of exists not just on the island but throughout the county and for that measure in many other places and it's homelessness and it's affordability of housing. Um, I've lived here 25 years and probably almost 50 years in Florida and I see growing numbers of people out on the street with carts and things, um, all their belongings and many of us in this room see that every day. Uh, not only here on the island but it's all over. And, one of the things that it's a problem that, that cuts across different agencies and uh, mental health, housing, and others as well. My question is, what is the role of the county commission? What is, the, what is being done at the level of the county commission to get agencies who operate separately to work together? Is there a task force? Are there people working on that problem? For instance, specifically, in other cities where I've lived and I'm in the area of mental health of my career in psychology, there are groups that go out in vans from various agencies and they stop people and they offer them food and they help them get housing and they help them with temporary assistance and long term. I've never seen that here and I've stopped and I've talked to some of these people on the streets. Okay. What is the county commission doing about this? Sure. I, I personally I think we're doing more with housing and homelessness than private and done and on time prior. It's probably going to change. And, and I'm, I'm going to get into the new bill. Because of the new bill. Yeah, I mean, get, that's, gonna, that's, that's, that's something we're already working on. Uh, we've been doing a lot. Like, one, we've built or facilitated, we haven't built anything, not built, we facilitated through changes in regulations, some gap financing we did, some other programs we've been with, more workforce and attainable and affordable housing in the past couple of years than probably the previous eight years before that. And this fiscal year, we're potentially looking at upwards of 2,500 homes under land use restriction agreements. So, we're doing a lot in terms of affordable housing. Does it is it fixing it? No, not by a long shot. We're waiting on it. But compared to some other places, I mean, I sit on panels all throughout the, the state talking about as an elected official, affordable housing, and pulling regulations and steps we're taking. And other counties reach out. I go to the affordable housing conference in Orlando every year and talk to them. So from a housing standpoint, we've got a lot of ways, a long ways to go, but I think we're making a lot of progress with it. As it relates to homelessness, well, as it relates to homelessness, we have been doing a lot these past couple of years. Um, the sheriff had one deputy for outreach, and she used to drive around Deputy Jewett and meet up with, with homeless in camps and so forth, see what they need, try to get them help. We funded and worked with the sheriff to fund more, so now there's four people doing that compared to the one previously. We've been funding turning points, helping, putting together things to help facilitate. We do things like the stand down, which Technically, it's for veterans, but it's open to all people who are homeless or near homeless to provide services. Um, so we're trying to get those services done out in the streets while also trying to come up with ways to get roofs over people's heads. One is with the affordable housing, but the reality is you kind of have to do it in tiers. You, you, you got homeless, then you got your transitional, and then you got your, your, you know, your studio, and then you're moving your way up. Where we're really lacking is that transitional part. Because it just doesn't really exist around here. We have ten home or ten beds, like ten hot beds at Salvation Army, but that's in the city of Bradenton. We have no authority to expand that, and they're not going to expand it. So you have ten beds that you can stay at a maximum ten days. That's not really helping. And there's such a lack of housing here. There's really not a whole lot of places you can put people into if you get them off the street. A lot of people don't want to be off the street. They don't want to lose all their stuff in the cart, as you were talking about. Uh, they want to be on the street. But, that's a, but, but people I, who want to be off the street, we don't have any place to put them. So we are working on something, and now the state basically said we're required to work on something. Um, we were working in a, a place up in Clearwater called Pinellas Hope. We also have one in Tampa. It's basically, for, for lack of a better term, and hear me out, it's uh, It's sort of like a tent city. But really what it is, and I went up and toured it with the guy who runs it, it's it's got two tiers, it's got tents that are up on kind of pallets, so they're off the ground, but it also has cottages. But it's got, it's got showers, it's got a community area, they've got offices for wraparound services that nonprofits can come in and work with people. They've got a mobile medical van that pulls up. And up. 
And you can stay there in theory as long as you want. The intent's supposed to be 90 days there. And then they've actually took additional land next to it and started building affordable housing for tax credits. So they do have a transition to a next step. The state just passed a bill that makes it illegal for any municipality to allow somebody to sleep outside. Yeah, so. oh it got signed either today or yesterday. Yesterday. Right. Today. Today. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's now illegal. And to make sure we chase homeless people out, um, effectively any citizen or business that deems themselves affected by this person sleeping in the public place can sue us for not moving that person. So this is the, the new bill that was just signed that basically says, if some business says, hey, that guy's sleeping in your park and that's affecting, nobody wants to come to my store, I'm going to sue the county. we got to get rid of this. Well, it's cost prohibitive to arrest them. Nobody wants to be arrested first off, because that's why you lose your stuff. That's the number one reason someone homeless doesn't want to do it. They go in there, they get a free bed, free shower, free food, free health care. I don't even know if they're that adverse to But they lose all their stuff. <laughs> they, that's, seriously. I went out, I went out with Debbie Jewett and, and I was talking to some the people in Tulsa. Like, why don't you just get arrested every now and then and get yourself a, a bed and shower? Like, so I don't want to lose the stuff. There's no way to put it. But now we're required, effectively, to create what I was saying, Spinell's Hope here. And, and fortunately, unlike a lot of other counties, we were, we had that ball rolling. We've been working on this. The question is uh, a couple of things. One, that bill says no alcohol or drugs at all can be in there. So the question is, how do you monitor that? How are you going to oversee it? You have to provide services like medical, like mental services and wraparound services. So you're basically forcing nonprofits to come work with you uh, because you have to provide that. Uh, you also have to leave. You can't have it in any one place for more than a year or some ridiculous rule. So basically, if you spend all this money building this place out, then a year later, you got to move it someplace. You can't go to any place that it could interfere or affect the language or specific language. Basically, you can't build it near anything. Like, you can't build it near other residential or other commercial or anything like that. Like, it can't inhibit or, or bother anybody else. So you have to basically build a tent city in the middle of nowhere where the, you're inevitably not going to have any transit. So you're putting people someplace where they're never going to get a leg up because they can't get a job, they can't get the wraparound service unless you bring them to them. And then once a year, you got to spend the money to move that someplace else and go on with the infrastructure. And if you don't have somebody in there and someone shows up off a bus and sleeps in your park, I get sued. So it's a problem. Um, on the plus side, I'm glad they're talking about it. It's probably the first time they've said homeless on purpose in the state legislature in five years. Um, it's kind of unfunded. I wish they would have done like they do with some of the other stuff and said, hey, we're going to require this and here's $500 million that we're going to divvy up to the counties to build that first one so you have a proof of concept with state money as opposed to our money. Um, but that's just got some. I want to say that that's a point for people. So we'll see what that looks like. But that is going to force people to work with homeless. And you know, the one good part of that is every county has to do it. You're not going to have a situation where we build it, which we already planned. And all of Sarasota will almost come off dust because we got a free place. Sarasota's going to have one. Yeah. And the going to have one. And Ellis going to have one. Because everyone's required to have one. So you're not going to get this, like, we're working on veteran maps. And one of the concerns, and it's something I pushed for for 18 months to get it approved. Fortunately, it did. But one of the concerns, which is ridiculous, but one of the concerns from the board was, well, if we build this thing for our veterans, what are veterans from someplace else coming out? The veterans were probably from the same country. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand the question. But that was one of their concerns, is if we build this thing, then what happens if a veteran from Sarasota takes a bus up here and wants to have a place to live? Well, it's a good it, veteran off the street. It's ridiculous. So anyway, if everyone has to build one, you don't have that same situation. But we are working on it, I, I can assure you. It's something a number of us have put a focus on. We're also building a family uh, shelter, because one of the problems is you have these single moms with kids. You can't throw them into the general population with a bunch of adult males by themselves. It, it, there's a lot of problems with that. So we're converting a police substation, once we get that out of their substation, into a family shelter, which will allow a single mom with their kids to have a place that's a little more secure where they get on their feet or work out potentially having some level of daycare or preschool there or a playground in the backyard that's on a transit line. So we are, I, I believe, we are in fact working on it. Again, these are big problems that are generational problems that are going to take years to fix and money to fix. You're not going to fix it all with a snap of a finger, but I do believe we're going to fix it. Is this only for U.S. citizens? 
Well, you're about to try well technically, technically, I believe the bill in the U.S. and the right, the bill in the state just said you can't have homeless people staying in public. It didn't say except for non-U.S. citizens, let them sleep in your park. <laughs> I mean, I don't have deportation rights. So if somebody's sleeping in a park and somebody sues me because that person's sleeping in a park and I have to pick that person up, put them in a tent, thing, where am I put, what's my alternative? I, I, I mean, I'm not, it's an honest question. I, if I can't leave them in the park, but I can't put them in the tent city, and I can't put them on a plane and fly them out of the country. Martha Vineyard. Governor. Put some on a bus. I think they allocated a reserve here to fly, didn't they? Yeah, he's saying he's going to fly into Martha Vineyard. But I'm going to say, he still has a reserve. This is the problem we have out here. In terms of homeless and affordable housing. Now, Manatee County has a thing where people could put the, I guess their ADUs, they could build guest cottages and hoping that they would rent them to affordable people. They all turn into Airbnbs. We have, and I'm sure you've heard about this, we have what was deemed the floating homeless camp down off the Bridge Street Pier where people live on boats. Now, I know a lot of those people. Most of them have full-time jobs in a restaurant on the island. Most of those people were evicted off the derelict boats because the derelict boats are now being rented as Airbnbs. Now the Coast Guard has shut down the ferry service that the woman uses twice because she's not a licensed captain. Okay, but as far as she told the Coast Guard and as far as the papers documented, she got licenses to rent derelict boats, okay, that used to be where our workers lived because they couldn't afford to live on the island. All those derelict boats now are Airbnbs. And so what my point with this? is when the county is coming up with creative solutions, we have to make sure there are restrictions on them. Like, we're going to let you build this rental unit in your backyard, but you can't rent it weekly, okay? Or please tell me how the fire, they can pass a fire inspection. If it's a derelict boat that doesn't have a dinghy that they can get on and off, is the fire escape plan jump in the water till someone comes? I mean, seriously, this is a real problem for the island restaurants. Derelict boats setting fires the real problem? No, no, no. Derelict the, the boats being turned into Airbnbs. How on earth do they get a state license to rent a derelict boat? Who is boat? renting these as a vehicle? Uh, it's called Sailor <laughs> Park. It's called Sailor Park. Okay, she's come up with a name. And like I said, the Coast Guard says she's not allowed to do the ferry service. He stopped her twice. Okay, but it's according really to the no. articles that the yeah, papers did, they're licensed. They're licensed. They're licensed. Brandon Beach says code enforcement can't do anything about them. Now, code enforcement sure boarded those boats when there were kitchen workers were living on those boats. But now that they're Airbnbs, they can't board the boats and make sure they're safe. Okay, I don't know what to do about it, but this is this is really. Well, it's it's <laughs> well, no, that's that's their Brandon Beach jurisdiction. Now, some of them, the ones that are not here, don't dissolve the city. You're gonna have a lot of problems. <laughs> 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 they don't have jurisdiction. But Brandon Beach got jurisdiction from the state to police the waters of the Anchorage when they were intending on turning it into a mooring field. But we all know that didn't. Uh, but but seriously, that is a problem when the only place that a homeless person can afford to rent. They're renting a derelict sailboat that doesn't move and doesn't sail. And they get evicted because somebody has turned this. She has said she well, takes it, abandoned it boats. It would be a nice energy. derelict boat if people are renting it as an Airbnb. Well, that's, that's my question is how does the county actually allow those things to be licensed? Allow anything to Okay. Do we have any I, I mean, it, it just, no, I don't. The Brandon Beach is not the county. You don't. The, but it's the same thing with, with <coughs> when the county said you could build these structures in their yards so that we it's could get some affordable housing. Wait, they all get licenses there. Okay. No, 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 no. That's a different thing. But all I'm saying is. You have to be built where the primary residence With these creative solutions we come up with. Okay? That should be working viable solutions. Is there any way to put some kind of restriction that we're letting you do this, but not so that you can turn it into another Airbnb, because that's what ends up no, happening. There is no restriction like that. The state controls that. Not and we, there's no way we can do anything. You're about to lose your restrictions that even the city has right now. Because no, I know that. That's, that's just, yeah. it's saying. just a way. We need, we, we all know we need to work better on this issue. Okay, and it's just a, a, another thing we need to look at. 
is how do we stop these solutions from being turned into Airbnbs? Now, I know things like Habitat, you sign a thing that says you can't do it, you can't flip it for so many years. Is there any way when we change? She was literally the CEO of Habitat. So, you know, oh, well, you right, 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 right. What proposes? Right. Well, land use restrictions would keep us from being from from selling it at right. market value or right. but, selling it. And don't they have to keep it for some? It depends on the land use yeah. agreements. Yeah. 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 But yeah. all I'm saying yeah. is, can we yeah. implement yeah. more creative yeah. solutions? No, I already said no. You cannot. You cannot. The state does not allow that. You do not have, especially us. Like right now, the cities yes, have, have some flexibility because they had the rules in place before 2011, right. so they all got grandfathered, and that's why everyone says Sarasota does. It's good for Sarasota. Sarasota right. had the rules right. in place. No, that part I understand. I'm just thinking. We do not. And the state file said if you do not have rules about vacation rentals in place at this time, they don't exist anymore. So we do not have the authority to. This and even bad. going for good nature, altruistic reasons of saying, well, can we have our boats you know, be used for homeless before they set on fire? <laughs> we are not allowed to do that. We have no control of that whatsoever. It doesn't matter if the boat or the house or any of you. Freedom Beach you. doesn't want them out there. They don't want the homeless people. They don't want the workers. They don't want the Airbnb. There doesn't seem to be anywhere to stop. So and that's extremely. So, what, was, what was your question? You started Oh, um, put a hole in the bottom. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're not allowed to ask any questions. Finish off 15 minutes before you repeat a question. Okay, we're going to lose. Okay, there is a plan out there to get from this boat working because they can't come to me. Yeah, that's a problem. Like, where do you see that big of a problem? Because I've talked to a lot of commissioners. Yeah. I'm on the board, the board of directors for the Port Association of Counties, so I talk to commissioners all over the county. Um, is down Monroe, like down in the Keys. That's a big problem for them because Key West and all those, they, they can't. You can't build a four class. It's, it's physically yeah. impossible. Yeah. Really. So they have to come up with creative things. They fortunately been able to use the political capital they have, coupled with the reality of their situation, to be exempted. Like they're exempted from what I talk about the homeless situation with the camps. They're exempted from that. A few other counties are because they have a unique situation. Um, they're exempted from or have some modifications to some things relative to the Live Local Act, which is the Affordable Housing Act. They've been working on something creative, and, and Orange County inexplicably started working on it too, which I think somewhat derailed the keys, because Orange County decided to hijack their thing for no reason, but just to be a pain. Monroe County, because right, we collect bed tax on all of our residents, the tourist tax, which you hear about, or put the trails or lack thereof and everything else. And so Monroe County said, hey, you know, we need housing for people to work in these restaurants and hotels or for the tourists. So they were proposing to be allowed to use the last penny, the high impact penny that they get, towards housing so they can build housing for the workers. Their justification wasn't really tourist related. The state seemed like that was something of interest, but then Orange County said, hey, we have way too much bed tax. We want to do that too. Then all of a sudden that kind of derailed. It's like, all right, now we're saying, you're, you're going to get too much tax. Maybe you should charge us tax. And not just find other uses for it. So it is a problem finding places. People, are like, you're not going to get a problem. You're just not. I mean, the land's too valuable. The house is too valuable. It's not going to be economic to do it. And, you know, it, it's one of the, the reasons why we need to consider that third lane, which we talked about at the beginning of all this, because then you can have that parking right and get the yeah. the workers out of there. Uh, we've also talked about, and I don't know if we implemented it or not, uh, having an early morning, like the first ferries that, that we have coming here be free for workers and the last one going back be free for workers to give them a way to shuttle in here without taking cars in so they can live more like in the downtown village they are it's all the place over there park in the downtown parking lot off the ferry and come to work um so there are there are some options here i know bridge street work on like we talked about their golf cart that doesn't really do anything now but they talk about using that for employees so people are trying to come up with solutions, but anytime you're on, on a small, expensive island, you're going to run into that same situation. How do you get the workers there? Uh, like the other day, Dumpy's shut down because they didn't have any work. So that, that's the problem. And so you run into that situation, but then it, it doesn't benefit anyone. So I, I don't have the answer, but you, we need to find a way to get the workers here because all record. these places need the workers. Otherwise, they're going to shut down. Uh, but you're not going to put them on the side. Years ago, somebody in Brandon Beach suggested a monorail, and everybody laughed. I'm kidding. 
Gee, if you could just get over the traffic, it doesn't sound so bad now. Okay, I'll remember the <laughs> <that we're gonna laughs> <laughs> <laughs> I'm not building on her. Are there any other questions? Comments? Jokes? <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Most right. If you ever want to email me, if you need my contact information, you know how to get it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, thank you.